Um, th first, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for putting together this, uh, this school and for inviting, uh, organizing all of this and inviting us here to speak. It's really uh, nice to be back. I was here 14 years ago as a first year student myself. And <laughs> the funny thing is uh, one of my main memories is that I learned to snowboard here. <laughs> and, uh, and in fact, the first two days, I fell so many times that um, I think it was the third or fourth day that, that I actually could not sit in a chair anymore <laughs> from falling so many times. So the fourth day, I actually had to go to the doctor and I missed the entire fourth day. On the fifth day, I went snowboarding again. <laughs> and I, 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 there was supposed to be a very, I don't know, some sort of moral to the story, but um, I couldn't really think of anything positive about it, but uh, in any case, um, yeah, it's very nice to be here and uh, uh, yeah, I hope you're going to enjoy this. There's one thing that uh, I would should say also on behalf of some of the other speakers, and that is um, we, uh, me not particularly this lecture, but we will be using these white boards uh, quite frequently as well. And I think in these cases, since we do not really have that much space to write, I think you know, when this happened, I'm not sure how we should do this exactly, but it would be nice to sort of get to the front as far as possible. You know, especially the theory part, I think it's quite important to, uh, to actually do it with, uh, you know, on the board, because if you just show equations, at least for me, that doesn't work at all, right? So uh, when it gets to that, and for me, it will be especially starting on, on Wednesday, I think it will be, uh, you know, a few lectures where there will be quite a lot of writing. So then, and I, know, I don't know for you, X, you probably do it today as well, right? Yeah, so, I don't know, maybe, you know, we, during the break we can just move all the tables all the way to the front and we just sit very close together, you know, in the name. <laughs> okay, but uh, I have 45 minutes, right, now? So, I'll start now. I used up already a few. So, this is a very exciting time to talk about physics of Lyman alpha radiative transfer. Um, and I'll just first introduce like why, why we care about Lyman and Alpha. And if, if we could dim the lights now, I think I will not use the... Could someone dim the lights a little bit? Uh, I will not be using the board now uh, much. <clears throat> Is that possible? For, for the lights to be a bit dimmer? Okay. Um, oh, okay, fine. Let them, no, no, then it's fine, then it's fine, then it's fine. If people ask, then it's fine. Yeah. No, I think it's... Then leave, yeah, then we can leave it. No, I think it's fine. I think it's easier to fall asleep when it's dark, so let's, let's keep it on, yeah. Um, so just to motivate Lyman Alpha and why this is ex an exciting time to, to learn about it. So first, you know, we know that hydrogen is the most abundant element in our universe, and this is a picture of Cecilia Payne. And she actually was, uh, well, she was the first to basically discover that the sun is composed mo mostly of uh, atomic hydrogen, or mostly of hydrogen. And at the time, it was very controversial, right? It was actually not believed that that could possibly be the case because, you know, on Earth, um, there's many other elements and how, how in the sun hydrogen can be so much more abundant than all these other elements. That was a big surprise. And she was actually sort of prevented from publishing these results. And then later, you know, sadly, the thesis advisor tried to run away with these results. So this was, at the time, very, um, very controversial. And by now, of course, this picture that the universe is mostly hydrogen is much better established. We know from observations of the cosmic microwave background that um, the universe, the universal energy content uh, is only, only about 5% uh, of the total universal energy content is in the form of ordinary matter, like baryons, leptons, and whatever ordinary stuff that we know about, that we learn about in particle physics. At only 5%. But of that 5%, now we know, also again from observations of the cosmic microwave background, that about 75% by mass is in the form of hydrogen, right? And 25% is in the form of helium, and the rest is basically heavier elements. It's a tiny fraction. So mostly hydrogen again. So then right now we know this, you know, this basically established fact. Right? I mean, we do not just know this from the cosmic microwave background, we know this from other observations, a whole suite of other observations. And, you know, when, once we look at, um, you know, so given that hydrogen is so abundant in the universe, it makes sense to actually study emission or absorption lines from atomic hydrogen. And it's not surprising that, you know, 
hydrogen lines associated with atomic hydrogen have, have already been extremely useful at studying the universe and really revolutionizing our understanding of the universe. And one of the most famous examples is this, this 21 centimeter transition. It's the hyperfine transition of the ground state of atomic hydrogen. We'll talk about this in my lecture seven. It's, it's a very interesting transition. Um, this 21 centimeter uh, transition has really taught us about, or has allowed us with a way to study, say, the dynamics of galaxies, etc. And it has really shown us that there is more to galaxies than just ordinary matter. There's more than stars, uh, gas, etc. You know, the rotation of the galaxies already implied that there should be something like dark matter, right? So, and this same line, the same 21 centimeter line is going to be the target of many of the low frequency arrays that are currently being built, right? Like these are just some examples, low, far, uh, in Europe, you have MWA and uh, the Murchison Wide Field Array in Australia. We have the Square Kilometer Array in Australia and South, South Africa. And the main goal of these facilities is to really detect hydrogen in this line, now to redshift as high as 15 or 20. Right, so this is going to be, um, uh, yeah, this is going to be a huge field if we, you know, for the next decades. And even as I will argue is, to actually understand these kind of observations. Understanding a little bit about Lyman alpha transfer can be very useful. Right. Now, Lyman alpha has, of course, already uh, played an important role in cosmology, and, but not perhaps so much in emission, but most the, the Lyman alpha absorption has been completely revolutionary in terms of observational cosmology. Right. This is an, an uh, observation of a distant quasar, I think redshift 3.6 or so. Um, no, I guess it's a bit different, but in any case, uh, if you look at if you look at this, uh, is there a pointer somewhere? Well, in any case, if you look at you, know, you see this bright Lyman alpha emission line in the quasar, and if you look at all these, these this noise basically on the right, these are real and real absorption features in the so-called Lyman alpha forest. And uh, X is going to tell us much more about this, I assume, in his lectures. So I'm not going to talk about this much more. The only thing I will mention about this is that. Oh, thank you, yeah. Lyman alpha in a, has already revolutionized observational cosmology when you study it in absorption, right? So I think now it's sort of, we, uh, what is exciting about this time is that I think we are sort of entering an era where Lyman alpha and emission um, is going to do something very similar to maybe our understanding of galaxy formation, right? So this is just a zoom up, um, zoom in of uh, Lyman alpha forest. And, uh, you know, Lyman alpha emission is already, has already been useful you know, in, in many ways. We know that, I think since, since this paper that came out in the late 60s by Partridge and Peebles, they basically said that if you have a young star forming galaxy, right, the ionizing photons that you emit in the most massive stars, um, these photons are likely not to escape from the ISM of galaxies, which is you know, what we now think is very much true. Right? So if these ionizing photons do not escape, they create their local H2 region, they ionize their environment, like within the ISM of galaxies. Within the ISM of galaxies, you then recombine and produce Lyman alpha. And it turns out that then you basically uh, transform all this, energy, all this radiation that was above the hydrogen ionization thresholds, and you transform most of it into a single emission line Lyman alpha. Right? And Partridge and Peebles 67 sort of showed that, you know, uh, if this is, say, the flux density of a distant galaxy in arbitrary units, Lyman alpha would go all the way you know, to 30. This is one, it would go all the way to 30, so it would, it would go through the roof, right? So the idea was that Lyman alpha is, is so bright in these galaxies, it should provide us with a very easy way of finding these galaxies. And it's remarkable to think about that, you know, if we think about, um, there are cases in which a single emission line can, in principle, contain as much as 40% of the total bolometric output of a galaxy, especially young ones, right? So this is, yeah, it's truly well, astonishing if you think about it. All this energy condensed into a very narrow range of frequencies, right? And for this reason, people have started looking, at, started looking for Lyman alpha and distant galaxies, and we're going to hear much more about this in other lectures today. And just to show one example that and we have used Lyman alpha to find the most distant galaxies, uh, well, some of the most distant galaxies uh, out there today, right? So this is an example by Zitrin et al., redshift 8.7. And this galaxy was identified again on the basis of the Lyman alpha line, right? So this is something that is, we're seeing and it's happening, right? It's, it's already being useful. But oh, this is a famous um, 
slug nebula. I think Sebastiano will not talk about this, but uh, Sebastiano, who discovered this in, with X, actually. Um, well, I mean, this is a remarkable object, right? This is a, if, you, if you look at the spatial extent of, spatially extended, of this spatially extended lamin alpha emitter, it's almost you know, 500 kiloparsec across. So this is, uh, it's, I think, many times larger than, say, the, you know, many, tens, many ten times larger than um, you know, the ordinary light of ordinary galaxies, for example. So then what, what is powering this emission is something that we are only just, you know, I guess, starting to uncover. And this is, it's really interesting because there are already hints that we're sort of seeing uh, emission along these kind of um, uh, filamentary kind of structures, right? So we're actually, we have this idea that we might be seeing the intergalactic medium, the first signs of the intergalactic medium in emission, right? And this is, I think, only, um, again, uh, the tip of the iceberg or something that we're going to do much more over the next decades. So these are the first observations of the, the cosmic web, if you want, in, in emission. Right? And we're going to see much more of that in the next years. Right, so why, why I sort of say, like, uh, this is going to change a lot. So just to give you some example of why this is going to be so, why this is going to be so different in the years to come, right? This is going to be completely, this, this field is going to be completely different in five, ten years' time. So this is one example. This is HEDDEX. It's a dark energy survey using lamin alpha selected sources. And what is interesting about it from, so HEDEX is basically a survey to study uh, the dark nature of dark energy using lamin alpha selected galaxies. And I will not talk about this much at all. The only thing I, what I will say now is that to do this, you basically need to increase the sample of lamin alpha emitting sources by two to three orders of magnitude, right? Orders of magnitude. So um, the, the sheer number of sources we're going to get just from this dark energy survey, and this thing is basically operational now, is going to go up tremendously, right? And that, that would be at redshift two to four. This is Subaru's hypersubprime cam together with a person, right? And that's um, to show this. I assume that is, <laughs> you're laughing, uh, Masami. I mean, I think it's an, um, uh, I guess the, what this picture shows you is that this instrument is big, right? In any case, um, what Subaru Hypersub Prime, Prime Cam will do is, again, uh, also boost the number of lamin alpha emitting sources, again, by up to a factor of 100 or more at different redshifts, right? Redshifts 4 to 7, right? So this is very nicely complementary to this HEDDEX survey in that sense. Now we have MUSE. MUSE is this new integral field spectrograph uh, that is now is already operating on, the, on, on ESO, ESO's Very Large Telescope, uh, one of them. Right? And what is exciting about MUSE is that it will able to give us spectra. When you see a spatially extended source, we'll get like spectra at each point in the source at high precision. Right? And this is, I mean, that was just not possible uh, very recently. And Sebastiano recently showed me some uh, data, showed some data, not just to me, but to many people. But, uh, um, you know, this is, yeah, you see this, and you know, I've never seen anything like this before, right? So this is... Uh, when you model this kind of stuff, you really, it requires completely new kind of modeling than what we've been doing so far. Right? So, it's, you know, this is, um, I think what, and this is not just everything, right? There's, this is just, the, the three instruments that I, I, that I mentioned are only, there's many more. We, of course, we have James Webb Space Telescope that's going to be launched in two years' time, and actually, uh, observing proposals, you can, the first call for proposals will be next year, right? So this thing, this James Webb Space Telescope, is actually something that is you know, relatively close around the corner. So we're going to get data from, from this telescope very, fairly soon. And there's many more other facilities that are being built in the long term that are also like perfect for studying this lamin alpha emission. Right? And what is interesting is, you know, here I sort of say that uh, unprecedented increase in the amount of data. I think the status of this field in that sense, in, in, in how much gain there will be, in how much more data we're going to get in the next years, is very similar in that sense to you know, the exoplanet community prior to the launch of the Kepler satellite. Right? This is the kind of boost we're going to see in the data. And I think, you know, you, you notice what Kepler did for the exoplanet community. So I think this is going to be, um, you know, this, so this is sort of my motivation for why Lamin alpha on emission is going to be you know, a super exciting field in the years to come. It already was, you know, uh, don't get me wrong, but I think it's going to be much more exciting uh, um, from now on. Okay, so, you know, this was uh, what, I, what I will be talking about. I have, uh, well, we have eight lectures. 
So what today I'll be talking about is, um, I'll talk briefly about the hydrogen atom, right, and it's necessary. And you know, this may be kind of elementary, but to me, just talking about the hydrogen atom at an elementary level is actually, uh, well, we will see that in, 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 um, in future lectures, you know, once you really go back to the basics, you can actually understand much better why, for example, scattering of a Lyman alpha photon by a hydrogen atom gives you very different polarization properties than scattering of a photon by a free electron, for example, right? And you can understand this in pretty simple terms if you go back to this very basic picture. So sometimes you may think, oh, this is complete, I've seen this a hundred of times, like, uh, why, you know, you don't need to tell us that, but uh, I'm just going for the, the lowest denominator. Like, um, I th I'm going to assume zero knowledge on this, and I think it's, you know, I think it doesn't hurt to refresh this kind of uh, knowledge. So what I will talk about for the rest are Lyman alpha emission mechanisms, right, the basic mechanisms. In lecture three, I'm going to use the, 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 the whiteboard more, so this is going to be about cross-section, and I think, you know, there's a lot of stuff you know, these, these series are about the physics of Lyman alpha radiative transfer, right? It is remarkable that something as basic as the Lyman alpha cross section is still something that people are writing papers about, right? Just to stress that the, the shape of the Lyman alpha cross section is still not well understood, right? Uh, I think there are still papers being pre prepared where people sort of refine the shape in the wings of the line profile. So this is, you know, it might be very, it might look very simple, but it's not, right? And I think it's. Uh, it's nice to appreciate this, and I'll try to convey this in the cross-section um, talk. Um, some other key concepts in Lyman alpha transfer are, I'll talk about frequency redistribution. I think this is something that, you know, will become, you know, this is a key concept in Lyman alpha transfer, so I will spend quite a bit of time on this. And I think once you understand this, then you basically underst you really understand the basics. You have the most basic tool that you need to understand Lyman alpha transfer. Right, and so once we've d addressed this frequency redistribution, which again, I think we'll be using up a lot of the, the boards, then I think you can really understand why, you know, why spectra uh, look the way they look when you have Lyman alpha photons through static media, uh, escaping from static media, expanding media, contracting media, multiphase media, etc. Right, and this also sort of, sort of sets us up to start discussing like um, uh, Monte Carlo methods of, uh, of solving Lyman alpha transfer equations, right? Following that, we'll talk about, you know, these are all still, of course, idealized representations of the transfer process. I'll talk about interstellar and intergalactic Lyman alpha transfer, like as much as I, I think we know about it, at least I know about it. And in, in, in part seven, uh, I'll talk about polarization, and I think that will actually be in hand with Monte Carlo radiative transfer, so I actually move that around. And what I, uh, in lecture eight, finally, I'll go to, other, uh, go to other applications, right? So I talked about this 21 centimeter line. And I think one of the, uh, one of the interesting things is, you know, if you want to compute, um, say, the 21 centimeter signal from the distant universe, uh, it turns out that you need to, you know, if you, well, you need to understand the propagation of Lyman alpha through the universe. And this is something I'll talk about. I think there's something, again, there's something really, well, pretty cool in there as well. So, this will be the outlook of my lectures, and um, yeah, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll start with the, the classical view of the atom. All right, so, um, so this is, this is a classic picture of the atom, right? That's, so we can move on now. Classic picture of the atom, you just have a proton, electron, and the electron is just whizzing around the proton at some velocity, right? Now, it was realized uh, very soon that in this picture, of course, once the electron starts, it whizzes around the proton, it's being accelerated, right? And at the time, classical theory was saying if you have an accelerated charge, it emits radiation, right? So if it, um, if it emits radiation, it loses energy, right? So it was actually realized that if you have this picture, your elect electron spirals inward over a time scale of 10 to the minus 11 seconds or 10 to the minus 10 seconds, right? So in our classical view of the atom, atoms were not stable objects, right? So this was kind of a minor inconvenience uh, that your most basic property of the universe is not stable in your, in your theory, right? So that's, that's a problem. So that's why, of course, this whole thing led to the revolution of, of quantum theory. And, you know, when, so Niels Bohr came along and said, okay, there is actually um, a, a, a ground state in, there is a ground state in the hydrogen atom, which is the most stable, is, well, it's the base, basically the most stable state, and that's, 
you know, the state that most hydrogen atoms are actually in, right? So what Niels Bohr said, he, d he basically enforced the minimum energy state in, in, in hydrogen atoms. And he didn't just say like, okay, the minimum, atom, minimum energy level is blah, so deal with it, nature. He basically said he did it differently. What he introduced was saying that, you know, if you look at the total angular momentum of the electron inside, the, 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 inside an atom, right? You just write total angular momentum L equals the mass of the electron times the velocity of the electron times the separation from the proton, right? So just in this picture, the separation between the proton and the electron are RE, right? So this would be the total angular momentum in the classical sense, right? Now what Niels Bohr said, okay, this is quantized. Uh, this, this quantity can only take on a discrete number, a discrete set of values, right? So this number, total angular momentum equals n times h bar, right? So this is the reduced Planck constant, right? And an n can only take on values of 1, 2, 3. And if you work out uh, what the total energy of the electron is inside the, inside the atom, right? And the total energy of the electron would be equal to minus E naught over N squared, right? This quantum number N squared comes back. Now here, E naught is known as the Rydberg energy and it's 13.6 EV, right? And um, the lecture notes that will come online, um, that will be, I think they will come online and we'll probably get a book at home and, you know, we'll present a derivation of why this comes in as N squared, right? Um, okay. So, right, so you have the energy, of course the energy is negative, right? The energy is negative because it's a bound electron. You need to dump in energy. You need to dump in 13.6 EV of uh, energy to get the electron out of the atom if it were in the NS2-1 state. NS1 would be the lowest energy state, it would be the ground state, right? So NS1 would correspond to an energy, binding energy of minus 13.6 EV. Right, this would be the ground state of the atom. Now if we have NS2, right, we get N squared here, so then it turns out the total binding energy is minus 3.4 EV. So the energy difference between these two states is 10.2 EV, and that's what we will talk about a lot in these lectures. Now one thing about uh, quantum mechanics is that, you know, this in a sense, this doesn't, yeah, this looks like a, yeah, a nice, um, well, it turns out, you know, with this kind of parameterization, you could actually re reproduce, of course, observed spectra that people had observed from the hydrogen atom in the lab, right? So this, uh, introducing this kind of quantization really allowed you to, to reproduce observed spectra of hydrogen atoms extremely well, right? So this was a very nice fix. Um, now, I think one of the more shocking things about quantum mechanics is that you don't, you know, you do not, in this kind of picture, you do not have an atom nicely orbiting a proton at just, say, a discrete number of orbits, right? It's not just the, you know, you have your electron in an orbit at some distance and then the NS2 state corresponds to another orbit some distance further out from the, from, from the proton, right? It's, the picture is completely different in quantum mechanics. What you do in quantum mechanics is that you, quantum mechanics basically says there are no orbits in, in, the, in the atom, right? Basically what quantum mechanics says is that the electron is described entirely by these so-called probability uh, wave functions, right? And these probability wave functions say squared, that's another thing that's, you know, in many ways completely counterintuitive. This gives you the probability that some, that an electron basically finds itself at some position R inside the, uh, inside the atom, right? So this is, um, this wave function squared times some differential volume element gives you the probability that the electron finds itself somewhere in the electron, uh, in the atom. And what is weird about this is that there is actually non-zero probability that the electron finds itself inside the proton, right? And that's, I mean, of course, there's no classical analog. And the reason I'm bringing that up is that if that were not the case, we would not have a 21 centimeter signal, as I'll talk about in, in lecture seven or eight, right? So this is actually relevant physically, right? Without this non-zero probability, we would not have 21 centimeter cosmology and astrophysics, right? So, um, right. Now, one thing that 
the final thing before I show you some slides, what quantum physics says further, is that this wave function is quantified not just by this, this quantum number n that I gave you here. You can imagine that this quantum number, this, this wave function here, depends on this, this quantum number n that I introduced earlier, right? Because that sort of specifies the total energy of the electron, so it must come in when you uh, derive the functional form of this wave function. It also depends on this other quantum number l. Right? And this, this other quantum number you can sort of see as in um, sort of determining the shape of the wave function of the atom. Right? And I'll show you some examples here. Right? Ooh. In any case, um, <laughs> that was a joke. But in any case, um, so here are just some examples of what these wave functions look like. Right? Um, um, this is n is 1 that I just talked about. L is 0. Right? There's other values, sub-values of m, and I'll just explain what these are in a second. And what you can see is as n gets bigger, right, you go to higher energy states, you basically increase the size of your, 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 your cloud, your probability cloud. Right? And that's just saying that the electron is more likely to be further away from the proton. It's entirely, it's entirely um, um, in line with classical theory. Now you go to n is 2, you go to l is 1, for example, so this is l is 0, right? l is 0 would just be, um, they're basically just spheres, spherical uh, wave functions. If you go to m, l is 1, you basically see you get these weird lobes already, right? You get these double lobe structures here. And as you go to higher values of n, you know, these things become weirder and weirder. That's the best way to describe it. Um, but this, I guess, you know, one way to, uh, and we, this is what we will use when we talk about polarization, you know, this affects this kind of stuff, these kind of shapes affect the polarization, for example, of Lyman alpha. So that's why I wanted to show you this. Now, yeah, so this is just, you know, if you, the simplest way to see this, for me at least, is that if you look at these kind of wave functions, n just denotes the size. L denotes sort of the, 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 the like the, the elongation, right? So the larger L is, um, the closer to spherical the wave function becomes. So if you have your n is 1, for example, or n is 2, it turns out, you know, and I cannot explain this, for this uh, you would need a proper uh, quantum mechanics course. If you have n is 2, you only have values of l from uh, 0 and 1. If you have n is 3, you only go from l is 0 to 1 and 2. It turns out that l basically runs from, 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 from 0 to n minus 1, right? So n And the higher this value of L, the closer to spherical your wave functions become. Right? So at low values of L, they basically become these deformed um, uh, shapes. And then M it doesn't really add anything. M is just give you, gives you the orientation of this weird distorted shape. Right? And we will not really talk about this uh, in these lecture notes at all. Right. Okay. So what you can then look at... I'll, well, maybe I should not show you this, but um, in any case, um, now, now we have sort of um, some, you know, we know um, both, we know that there's different so-called quantum states in the hydrogen atom, and they're associated with a different kind of energy, right? So, for example, if I draw energy levels, I'm going to use the, I'm going to use this board, and it might be difficult for you to see. Um, let's see, I'm going to try. So let's say you draw the ground state of, the, uh, of the, the atom here, right? So you have your ground state, which corresponds to n equals 1, and then we know that L has to be equal to 0. This would be the ground state. It's at minus 13.6 EV. First excited state would be 10.2 EV up. That would be here. Now we know there's not just one state. There's two states, right? We have L equals 0 and L equals 1, right? And one way we usually call, denote these states is we call the ground state usually 1s. This is called the spectroscopic notation, and I don't even know where this comes from. Um, so this we call this 1s, we call this state 2s, and we call this state 2p. Right. And then you have your ns3 level, which lies up even further. There you have three levels, etc. Right. So this would be 3s, 3p, 3d. Now, okay, so you can imagine that within the atom, if you have an atom within one of these excited states, you can radi radiatively cascade down to these other states. And, um, well, and that's true, right? This is so that nicely confirms the observations. It turns out that it's not, 
true that you can just um, connect between any of these states. There are what are called selection rules at work. Right? And it turns out that the selection rules, at least as far as we are concerned, are, um, um, are quite simple. Uh, the selection rules basically say we only permit transitions such that this quantum number L changes by one. Right? It can be minus one or one, and that's it. Right? This is the selection rules that are relevant for our work. Right? So delta L has to be one, basically. These are the permitted transitions within the, within the atom. Now, we call, so you can see, for example, transitions from the 2S state to the 1S state are not allowed. Right? So it turns out that we, transitions of the form from NS2 to NS1, the only thing that is allowed is 2P to 1S. Right? Now this is then what this conference is about. This is the lyman alpha transition. Right? So, good. So this would be the Lyman alpha transition, and we call it Lyman alpha because Lyman alpha is just the first of the whole Lyman series transitions, right? We have Lyman beta would go from 1s to 3p alone, right? There's nothing else allowed from 1s to the ns3 level. 1s to 4p would be Lyman gamma, etc. Right? So these are from these transitions from the ground state to the np states are known as Lyman transitions, right? And this, um, um, yeah are the ones that we will consider most in this, in this course. Um, now, you know, you have other transitions from the NS2 state from between N and 2 and NS3 would be Balmer. Uh, all the transitions upward from the NS2 state would be Balmer transitions. You know, they're known as Balmer transitions. And again, you can imagine if you're in the 2P state, you can go either to 3S or 3P, but not to 3P. Right? So there are all these different um, rules at work. Right? So, just to give you some picture here, right? So just what I explained to you earlier. So we have the ground state of the hydrogen atom here, right? So 1s. Lyman alpha would connect you only, you know, this nice small spherical wave function. You go to 2p. And as I showed you earlier, the 2p state corresponds to this very strange double lobed kind of wave function, right? So this absorption of a Lyman alpha photon transforms your hydrogen atom from this into this. Right? So it's kind of weird, right? This, um, yeah. 3P would be Lyman beta, etc. So just to give you some examples of radiative cascades, I think this is, this is an amazing movie that I was making on the plane yesterday. I was really tired, so <laughs> the, the, just how sophisticated this is reflects the level of tiredness. Anyway, so my apologies for that. So 4P, for example, can go to 3S, right? That's allowed. Delta L is 1. Fine, yeah, that's allowed, electron. Can go to, the only thing it can do now is go to 2p, right? Because from 4, 3s, it's stuck. It cannot go anywhere but 3p, 2p. That's great. From 2p, we emit Lyman alpha. So this was a, radi a cascade that gave us Lyman alpha. Right? Another one can go to 3d. Right? <laughs> that was allowed. 2p again. <laughs> so this again gave us a Lyman alpha uh, photon. Right, so we'll get to this when we talk about Lyman alpha <laughs> mechanism. So it's, it's nice. I actually, I, I, this makes me laugh as well. You know, I think it's. Uh, uh, but the interesting thing is that this sort of tells you. This already shows you that some of these states, when you when you have an atom that is in a particular quantum state, it's much more like. It's very like either very likely to give you Lyman alpha photon or very unlikely to give you Lyman alpha photon. Right? There's other trend states like, you know, once you are in 3P, you will not get Lyman alpha. Right? It will not happen because you can only go to 2s, you're stuck. Well, not quite, but we will not talk about this. You can, of course, also do this. This is perfectly allowed. Delta, the, the L changes by one. There's no, lim there's no restrictions on how your quantum level N changes, right? So this is a allowed transition. It gives you Lyman uh, gamma. Right? So just some examples of, here I've given a, a set of allowed radiative transitions, and I've ignored all the transitions to the ground state for reasons I'll talk about in another lecture. But here I have uh, sets of transitions that give rise to Lyman alpha photons in green, and other transitions that give rise, rise to something else in red, or not Lyman alpha in red. Right? And it's, you know, this is the kind of thing that we will look at once, you know, once you talk about astrophysical sources, and right? once you talk about astrophysical sources, you care about um, you have recombining gas, you would like to know what is my production rate of Lyman alpha photons 
You have to take in all this into account to, to calculate what is the fraction of my recombinations that gives me Lyman alpha photons, right? So this is what you need to know to actually compute the Lyman alpha production rate in an astrophysical gas. Right? But the, the, thing, the simple thing is, or the thing is, you know, this is just applying these selection rules. And as we will see in, in, in later, later lectures, you sort of, the only thing you need to know is, you know, what is the relative probability of going from, say, 4p to 3s or to this state? Uh, this, this, prob this branching ratio, so the probability that you go either this way or this way, you can, again, calculate entirely from atomic physics. Right? So this is something we will talk about as well. And it turns out that, you know, I'll just give you like a, a quick result anyway, is that it turns out that if you have an electron and, and, and a proton recombining, right, they usually recombine in any kind of quantum state, right? There's no, there's, they can end up in any quantum state, basically. So if you then take into account this radiative cascade, you can, you can show that you produce like about 0.6 Lyman alpha photons. And the famous number that you often see in the literature is 0.68. You produce about 0.68 Lyman alpha photons per recombination event. Right. right. So how much time do I have? Not much, I guess. Right? Excellent. So yeah, so the main, main things I want you to take away from this lecture is that um, hydrogen is the most abundant element in our universe, and lines associated with atomic hydrogen have revolutionized our understanding of, 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 of our universe, right? There's no doubt about this. Um, and I think, you know, uh, Lyman alpha emission has been extremely useful, but I think the, the real potential is, is still to come, right? And I think we're going to see this in the next years. And I mentioned this before, but the reason it's so exciting now is that we're really at a time where, you know, the data is going to come in like at a rate that we've never seen before, and it's already starting, basically. So in the next lectures, I really, what I really will try, you know, I'll try to tell you as much as I can about the theory of Lyman alpha emission, how it propagates, etc. And then hopefully, you know, we will be able to take full advantage of this rich data set that is coming in. So I'll hand over the microphone to my colleague. Who's coming, actually, now? I think we have time for a few questions. Okay. Yeah, and I think it's, we also agreed that, you know, everybody, you, you can also ask questions if you, yeah, you can. <laughs> and they can even be mean, as for what we agreed on this morning. So, Matthew, feel free to be mean to me, you know, it's absolutely fine. What happens when you end up in that 2S for stuff level? Yeah. Ah, that's, that's mean. I think I'm not going <laughs> to. <laughs> now, so, uh, yeah, so I didn't have time to talk about this, but, um, you know, if you, you're not, you're, 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 you, once you're in a 2S level, you're not stuck, of course, otherwise this would be a stable, this would be a stable transition, right? There's, you can still go to the ground state, but it turns out that you can do this by emitting two photons, right? And that, this is called the two-photon channel, basically. So you go to the ground state by emitting two photons, both with a combined energy of 10.2 EV, and the distribution of energies is, of these photons is the same. Uh, of energy, uh, sorry, uh, well... Yeah, so they're, they're basically the, the, the energy distribution of, say, one of these photons is sort of uniformly between the two energy uh, states. Right? Now, um, right, so that's uh, another trend possibility is, of course, is that in the real universe, you can have an atom in a 2S state, right? And, and this, this process for emitting two photons at the same time is rare, right? So... Um, the lifetime of atoms in this particular state is about nine orders of magnitude larger than the lifetime of an atom in this state, just because it's really, it's called a forbidden transition. Right? And because this atom is more stable in this state than this state, it might be possible that there is a collision between uh, an atom in this state and a nearby proton or electron or something like that. And that may actually put you back in a 2p state and then you're free to cascade down. So you can still, you can get out of this state in, the, in, 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 in several different ways. Yeah. Thanks. That was a useful question. Yeah. Yes? So, so a follow-up on that, can you take advantage? Do you need to uh, take this into account in your code? The, the, the two S state. Or, for example, can you collisionally excite to a higher line, which then goes back down to an allowed, via an allowed transition down to the two P state? You, yeah, you have to take this into account, yeah. So the yeah, yeah. Well, okay. 
I think it, it, it's, it depends on the astrophysical environment, but it is something you should always think about. Right? Um, I mean, for example, uh, when I talk about how you actually get, how do you get in these different states, right? It can be through collisions, it can be through recomb recombinations. When you talk about recombinations, you have to take into account coming in through these higher states. Right? Collisions, for example, you can have a collision that go, brings you from 1s to 3s. Like collisions do not really obey these selection rules, right? So collisions can bring me anywhere, right? It can bring me from 1s to 3s, then I cascade down like this. This is something that it turns out that for most, it's good to keep it, you know, good to take it into account. It turns out in practice that, that the, energy the energy difference between this particular two states is a few EV. And in practice, that turns out to be only it's a small correction to say, if you want to compute the rate at which Lyman alpha is producing collisions, right, you would like to take into account all these other mechanisms as well. That turns out to be, say, a 10% correction. Right? And interestingly, I think a 10% correction is still, I'll talk about this, 10% is sort of the uncertainty in these rates to begin with. Right? So it is sort of a, an interesting correction, which you should take into account, but it's not like changing everything. Right? Yeah, thanks. Yes. So when in, in rigorous and other literature produces KP recombination to produce lemon alpha, yes. is that just one particular path? Or is it, you know, that you go away from the issue to produce this condition? What exactly is this? Does it actually mean? That's a, a good explanation what that actually means. Yeah, that's a very good question. And I wanted to, I wanted to uh, the reason I didn't mention it very clearly today, or I didn't mention it at all, said I wanted to talk about it next lecture. But I, I'll, I think since you brought it up, Case B versus case A was the question. You often see in the literature that this particular number applies for case B recombination, right? What case B recombination assumes is actually what I'm showing here. Case B recombination says we do not allow any transitions other than Lyman alpha directly to the ground state. So we do not allow 3P to 1S. We do not allow 4P to 1S. We do not allow direct recombinations into the ground state. And the reason is that um, it is thought that once these transitions occur, you emit a photon that is very likely to be absorbed. Uh, the mean free path of these photons is very short. So we think we reabsorb these photons locally again, right? So actually each time you, you, know, you go from 4P to 1S, the idea is that there is a near, you basically uh, compensate for this, this by reabsorbing this same photon nearby. So you basically bring another atom uh, back into the 4P state. So the way, um, we account for this is basically just ignoring all these transitions, right? And it turns out, it turns out it's not like people have looked at whether this is reasonable, right? You can imagine that there are cases in which, um, you know, say, I don't know, these kind of transitions, these photons can still escape, right? So there might be environments where this is the case. So people have looked at this. So now, this is something that you, have, you, you, you may have to worry about when you do really detailed calculations. But I think for most of the things we talk about, like we're going to work with case B and you know, that's, it's quite accurate. So this is the difference. And case A would just take, allow for all these transitions. And when you allow that, you get basically 50% uh, Lyman alpha per recombination. Yeah, good question, thanks.